We're doing some statistical astrology and today I'm going to look at how to work with basic t-tests. Um, I may mention ANOVA or logistic regression in nine data analytics platform. I'm, this is free. It's a, it's a very lovely program. Um, I learned data science and, and basically got into my current IT field through self-teaching through nine. And the reason you can do that is because this program is free. And then if you click just around into space, it's recommending some nodes for you, like a table creator. Once you put the table creator down, boom, and you, you've clicked on it. See, look, it's recommending some things that people often use. Oh, reference row filter, nice. String manipulation, nice. And, and if you don't know what it does, you could look over here to see what the thing does. And so just by playing around in nine, you can kind of get a recommended walkthrough for doing certain kinds of things. It's really neat. Um, so NIME actually talks to a lot of other programming interfaces on your machine. So if you have MATLAB or Python or R or things like that installed in your machine, NIME can talk to them. In order to turn your computer into basically an astro lookup machine to where you can find asteroid positions and angles like the midheaven and the house cost and all that other stuff, you download not only Nine, but you can download R. And within R, you download this library called SwiftR. Once you've installed R, you, you run that separately from Nine. And then you look for the libraries in R, just like you would any normal library. And SwiftR is the Swiss ephemeris for R. And uh, as long as you have some place where you've stored your ephemeris files. So if you have a program like Starfisher or something that says, okay, this is how I look up asteroids. You put them in a folder on your drive and you can tell this library where to look them up. And lo and behold, you get stuff like this. So now I'm using my code to, to look this up. Let me, let me see if I can kind of expand this for you. And you can see what I did in order to get SwiftR to work. This is all the code I wrote. I'm going to pause and slow down for a second, just in case you're interested in this. This is what my R snippet node looks like. Now, this is not going to work if you haven't installed R on your computer and had nine talk to it. But, uh, and it's not going to work if you don't have this folder with your ephemeris files. You can get this folder, not this folder, but you can get the files that you need from the download area of astro.com. So um, very, very briefly, I'll tell you how to do this. Um, ultimately, let me, let me open up a window here and go to nime.com. I'm, uh, I'm on my other screen, so you're gonna have to bear with me for a second. Edge is opening up. And uh, here we go, nime.com. Get this program, it's awesome. I love these people. I'm so proud that they've grown so much over the years. Their, prog their, their, their basic program is free. If you wanna do server stuff, you can, you can actually pay for it. If you wanna to go to their classes, you can pay for those too. And I'm, I'm very happy with these people. It's very nice. So, so anyway, you've got, you've got nime.com and you know, they ask for your email stuff, but they don't bother you too much. You also need R statistics. R statistics. R statistics. R project.org here. Okay. And you can download this. Once you've downloaded this, you can look up. Swift R as a library. Now you won't do this online, but you'll do it from within the R interface. Swift R. This is the Swiss ephemeris for R. High precision Swiss ephemeris. Okay. You'll download this from within R, right? Just as a library package. And uh, then 
when you want ephemeris files, well, you'll end up going to this place, astro.com. Let's go to astro.com right here. And let's look for Swiss ephemeris. Swiss ephemeris. Let's see what they have. Okay. Ah, right, here we go. Um, let's go to Swiss ephemeris documentation because I think this is legit. Oh, what is all this? Oh, this, these are the functions on how to use Swiss ephemeris. Nice, nice. Okay, but that's not what we want. Um, I'll just go to their ephemeris page and see what they have. Okay, Swiss ephemeris for users, not what we're interested in. Swiss ephemeris for programmers is what we're interested in. Okay, this leads to the real documentation, but notice this area over here, download area HTTP. You can go here, go to EFI, the ephemeris files, and all in here, are the thousands family for your asteroids. So if you want asteroid 6,000, you'd go to AST6. If you want Eris, the body Eris, 136, 199, you'd, that's 136,199. You'd go to AST 136 right here. S, look, these are ephemeris files. So we'll go in here and look for 136, 199, and that there is Eris. How do you know this? Uh, well, you could just go to things like the Minor Planet Center and look this up. Um, it, they have numbers, like all these asteroids have numbers. So offhand, I don't, I don't really know of a good place where you can get all these numbers. I think it's the Minor Planet Center, though. Um, let's, let's, let's do a search and, uh, just look asteroid numbers. Oh no, we don't want all that. This is a whole bunch of, whole bunch of stuff. Let me, let me look to the NPC. It's, it's just, uh, minor planet center. Uh, list. Okay. Oh, you know, you could also get them from Wikipedia. There you go. It's Wikipedia pretty legit. Numberings. Boom. Oh, it doesn't have the names. Oh, well. Let's go to just kind of a random thing. Hey, there you go. So they've got numbers here. It's the name of the original asteroid. Now they have, they have other names. And then they've got numbers next to them, right? So if you wanted Palermo, you see Palermo, it is 10,001. And so in this place, you would go to AST10, right? Because it's, it's 10,000. And then 001. This one here is Palermo. Does that make sense? Right? When you download these, they go in a folder somewhere on your computer. And for me, that folder is C colon backslash SWEF backslash FE. That's kind of standard here. And all of a sudden, any program you use that references that folder will be able to find that file and calculate Palermo. If you don't download that and you try to calculate Palermo, you're not going to be able to. Now, in a previous recording, I calculated the asteroid Benjiki Toba, which is number 17102. When you're looking up asteroids that are not the basics, like Moon, Mercury, Mars, um, and, and so on. Neptune, this is Neptune number 8. Um, mean node is number 10. Selene is number 56. But when you're looking past that, you want to look up, uh, I don't know, uh, Ada or Adalberta or Lachesis, all those guys. You have to add 10,000 because, because those asteroids had to be pushed to the side in order to make room for the basics, right? So there's an asteroid, number four, 
is an asteroid number five. But then again, the fourth and the fifth are reserved for major planets. So anyway, I'm looking up 17102 as 27102. Eris, we just said it was 136199. You would look it up in Swiss ephemeris as 146199. Remember to add 10,000 in order to get this stuff going. Anyways, so that's just kind of a kind of a preview. Now in here, um, let's go ahead and do some stats on it. I want to know if it makes a difference for people to have their midheaven in a certain area. Now, normally when you're you're new to astrology, folks are like, okay, Sagittarius, your sun in Sagittarius means this. Your sun in Scorpio means this. Your sun in Aries means this. And what they're essentially doing is saying, if you had a column in here called your sun, and it told you the degree location of your sun sign, they'd be saying that if your sun, let's take Libra, for example. Uh, Libra is between 180 degrees and 210 degrees around the normal, the normal circle. And so what they'd be saying is that if your sun fell somewhere between 180 degrees and 210 degrees, it's in a like a bin, and that bin is more likely to be associated with these particular adjectives. Does that make sense, right? And so the way you would test that or verify it statistically is by saying, okay, well, when I do, say, a t-test, do people with their sun between 180 and 210 differ from an independent group with their sun somewhere else other than that? You could also do it wholesale by saying, let me break up all of these degrees into their 30 degree chunks and uh, see if they differ on anything. And that would be an ANOVA. I challenge you to do this on your personal computer on a dictionary of say 15,000 words, because that's, that's what I'm doing here. You have to cut it up in pieces. You can do that analysis, and in fact, I did. Um, but I'm not gonna show you how to do it here because it's a, it's a bit of a pain. Um, and, and also, it, it takes too long to kind of get into all the chunking and the breaking up and, and, and all that other stuff. I did it, but I didn't do it on sun signs because sun signs are boring. And when you're, I mean, when you're new to astrology, the whole, the whole, you know, sun in Virgo means this, sun in Leo means that, is interesting to you. But uh, astrology has so much more to it. I mean, it's not just sun signs. There are moon signs for your emotions. There's mercury signs for how you logically put stuff together. There's Mars signs for how you influence. There's Neptune signs for how your vibe works. Neptune is very slow, so you normally won't get a lot out of this. Um, there's your ascendant and your midheaven for how you approach things and why, or how people kind of say you are. And the other thing is that signs themselves get boring after a while um, because, uh, well, maybe they're not boring, but, but I'm a little bit spoiled. I don't look things up in terms of Scorpio versus Libra versus Aries. I look things up versus in, in terms of Scorpio, the one-twelfth slice of Scorpio, because there's higher resolution there and you can get... Um, more specific traits, because people with their sun in Scorpio one degree, one degree, are going to be different from people with their sun in Scorpio twenty nine degrees, right? And so that's that's not high res resolution enough. We're going to go ahead and get started here, and I want to know if uh, people with their midheaven in the same place as my own midheaven tend to um, have a particular trait. See, my midheaven is here. 248 degrees. So it's in eight, de uh, eight degrees Sagittarius. Now, it, it, don't worry about this video only concentrating on a particular area. Worry more about the kinds of statistics we're running. So anyway, this is between 247.5 and 250. That's the 1 12th slice of Sagittarius. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, put together a rule engine. And the rule engine is going to be on, let's, let's do it on this, this. And I'm going to say, if the midheaven is 
greater than 247.5. Uh, greater than or equal to. Got clumsy fingers going. And the midheaven is less than 250. It doesn't matter really whether you do greater than or equal to or greater than and, and so on and so forth. It doesn't matter that much. This is the law of large numbers. It's the same region. So, and it's over time anyway. The tropical astrology chart, which I'm using right here, um, may not be the best for constant things across history, but we're going to go ahead with it for right now. Um, then put them in... Uh, we're, we're just going to assign a 1 here. And we may need to change that later. If they're not in... If the midheaven is not in those areas, then by default, this is how you do a default or not. You type true and make it zero. That one tells you that, okay, if it's not in there, otherwise, just you put a zero. And we're going to attach an outcome called is in, uh, well, in section. I call those sections duodecanates, but whatever. So here we go. Whoops, we, I ran it. I right-clicked, and then I executed. Clicked a little quickly here. Is the person in that section? Is the person's planet? I'll say asteroid because I'm dealing mostly with asteroids. Is the person's asteroid in that section? Okay. And now, there you go. That person has their midheaven there. There'll be a couple of other people who have it. It's going to be one out of 144, though. So it's, you know, it's, it's a really, really high resolution thing. Now, at this point, we don't need any of these other guys. Like we don't, most of these columns are not columns that are important. So really, all we needed was the row ID. And uh, I think that's it for this kind of analysis, at least, because we're done looking up everything else. So I'm going to put in a column filter and take out everything except for what I just calculated in section. And I always want this to be the only column. So if I added random columns and I enforced exclusion, those random columns would come over here because enforcing exclusion means I, I'm sticking this list as it is. I don't want to do that. I'm going to stick this list as it is. So if random columns come in, they're going to go over there and they're just going to get thrown out. Okay, let's put column filter. Boom. Okay, this is it. Do, do they have their midheaven? between 247.5 and 250. That's all that says. Let's erase this. Okay. Next, we are going to take these 42,000 stories and join them. I wonder if this is the correct joiner. Let's, let's take a look. Okay, so this, this joiner puts on basically parts of speech. I don't know if that's really what I want. Um, this use of the joiner, uh, maybe this one. So, so I take these stories, but I also really just wanted to, in here, expand out this one column. And I don't see that column. Oh, there it is. I wanted to expand out the terms from these folks' wikis, right? So this, this is really the only column that I want. Um, I do that work down here already. It takes a long time. And so I split out that column collection, right? Let's go back to this table. See this dot, dot, dot? That means it's a list as a data type. And so you run a node called split column collection uh, to, to expand those out. And it makes this vertical list. Unpivoting lets you, well, okay. It makes this, this sideways list actually. Unpivoting makes it vertical, and then I'm doing some other things on this. But but both but ultimately, um, 
this is the big table that has everybody's words. Okay, good. It didn't take that long. But here you go. Oh, no, you know what? This was a filter. I just filtered out the words. Um, interesting. I only filtered out the words of people who had uh, the traits. And I don't know that I want to do that. So so here, let's, let's do this fresh. We unpivoted already. And we got this kind of list, right? Not unpivoted, I'm sorry. We, we split the collection column already. See? Homicide, kill mistress, gunshot. Okay, cool. Um, we want these words and we, we kind of want them to be their own thing. How many, how many columns was this, by the way, when we split the collection? 939. All right. Well, whatever. So let's take this list of split value columns and attach them to these people's names. I'm just going to use a joiner for that. Uh, let's go in here, get a joiner going. There's a joiner. And we're going to join these people to this. Okay. And we're going to match on the row ID, which had the name, and the name, which also had the normal name. And it's going to be an inner join because I don't want to join people who didn't have wiki articles because they have no words. Um, uh, when I join, I'm going to really only keep the split value columns. Hmm. But they won't always split into the same. Ah, look, look, see this? Manual selection, wildcard, type selection. Let's do a wildcard selection. Okay, this is what I want. We want the columns called split value. Split. With a star. Ah, look, wildcard. This, this is all I want. Nice. And, uh, okay. There was some filtering that I needed to do, though, because not everybody in here had an ascendant or midheaven because they didn't have a birth type. Um, and you'll notice this if you go into the, well, you'll notice this if you go into the original table and you start seeing folks who didn't have, uh, look, they didn't have this. And I, I did some calculation to produce the midheaven. Um, so let's, if they had a blank ascendant, I want to throw them out. I forgot to do that. So I'm going to go in my roll filter. Boom. And I'm going to say, Ascendant, exclude missings uh, by attribute value, only missing values match. Okay, let's try that. Okay, so now we have 59,000 folks. And all of these people in here have ascendants in midheavens because they have birth times. They came from Astro Data Bank. So they're, they're legit. Column filter is produced, we join, and it's an inner join, nice and fast. Let's look at the join result. Okay, cool. So we see that these people did not have their midheaven there. And then they had these words. Okay, cool. Some people had, had it there. Um, Again, it's one out of 144, so it's going to take a while to find them. This person, this person here. Okay. Anyway, so on and so forth. This person here. Let's now take this list. You see this list here? It's 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 out of order. Like they don't. There's no rhyme or reason to this. So in order to get this list to be correct, and again, right, you would have crawled wikis through nine the get request node. Um, to, to, to get these words and then done some, some pre-processing. Too big for this recording, but I want to make this into a nice organized table. The way I'll do it is to unpivot and let's, let me do that fresh again. Unpivot. 
whoops, don't want to double click there, click on this and double click from there. All right. What are we going to do? In the unpivoting node, we want our value columns to be the split values. That's what's going to become vertical. We don't want in section to become vertical. So we're going to keep that over there. Also, we, we want to force in section to be the thing that we, we retain. So this can change. There may be split value through 50 or split value through 50,000. So we're going to enforce this to always be out so that these can change with new numbers of split values. And we're going to force this one to be in all the time. And we're going to skip rows containing missing values. So if you didn't have the word homicide in your article, I'm not going to put a question mark next to your name under the homicide category. So we want to skip that. Okay. Right. Oh, nice and quick. I love you, Nime. Nime has improved over the years uh, with its processing. Okay, look, we don't really care what column it came from. What we do care is that the words were associated with, with uh, different, so we got Steven Spielberg here. Okay, anyways, um, what we do care is that, that the words were associated with this, this stuff over here. I'm gonna now pivot it. I'm gonna pivot it back. You're like, why would you do that? Well, you'll see. Ultimately, we want the names of the people. Actually, um, yeah, the, the the groups that determine the pivoting and how it works is going to be based on maybe their names. The pivots themselves are going to be based on the different words that came up. These are going to organize those columns the way we want it to. And then, um, oh, that's also put in in section. Okay. So we'll group, whoops, that's not under pivots, that's under groups. Okay, so names and this, that, that will retain the columns very easily. And then manual aggregation is, is nothing more than uh, you need something to put in these squares. So what I'll do is I'll just say whether they had a yes or a no. Um, instead of first, um, I'm going to do a count. And you'll see why in a second. Pivot name. Retain the row order. And sort lexicographically. We'll put my columns in order. Who knows how long this one's going to take? Oh, not bad, not bad. It's pretty fast. Let me uh, pause this, though. Okay, it's about two minutes later. Let's see what we got. It may take a second because this, this table um, is going to be kind of wide, right? This was on all. 42,000 wiki people. So who knows who knows how long it's going to take to show up in the port. One thing that I want to note is that I've never done this analysis. I'm actually doing it as I record. So I don't know if there's going to be any uh, legitimate statistical difference for, for Midheaven in that particular area. They may not be. Um, the Midheaven, by the way, acts just like an asteroid. If it's got an angular position, you can do it. By, by uh, I mean, you can test it like any other asteroid. So if the sun is in a certain degree or if the moon's in a certain degree, midheaven is the same thing. Um, but like I said, I, I don't know if any statistically significant results are going to come out of this. Okay, so the word A, the word A list, the word A team, the word AM. And uh, you can see that not only do we have the groups, but we also have whether the word showed up. 25,000 columns. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh, mm. you know, that's going to be troublesome. So, but let's, ooh. oh, that hurts. Dang. 
we don't we don't like this. We don't we don't we don't want this this as a that's that's too many columns and it's too many words to work with. Um, so so what I probably need to do is go back to my oh million and a half words. Man, that is just so sad. Okay, so so what I want to do instead is filter this a little bit. You notice that the article A was was in there, but also there may be words like Spielberg itself, and that's too rare. So there's some words that are too rare and some words that are too common, and we don't we we don't really want to compare on those. We're gonna what what we'll do is filter this. I, I can't have twenty five thousand columns. If you know nine. Have you ever seen a table with 25,000 columns? I know you have, but have you worked with one successfully and easily <laughs> without using a mainframe or something? So uh, we need to filter this. Let's filter it this way. We're gonna use a group by. And uh, I'm gonna take these column values. Now I'm forgetting what, what was going on here. Column names was split. Column values was the word, I believe. And I'm just going to count. No, not in section. I'm going to count how many there are. Oh, yeah, I could count in section. But let's count row IDs because this is, this is more of a, a measure of, of uh, how many times that thing appeared. Count. Do not count missings, right? And um, we're just going to keep the original name the row order and let's see what we get count word frequencies all right group table look at these word frequencies homicide occurs 501 times I like this I like this on the spot occurs twice now why would we want to do statistics on that word right so keeping this in mind, Let's use something called the normalizer. I'd use this all the time because the normalizer does some basic statistics for us. Well, it can. We're going to take the row IDs column and normalize it by Z-score. Z-score. Uh, Z-score basically is standard deviation. And uh, it's how many standard deviations. You can see right here. Each value in, value in each column are like this. And uh, we're going to assume that, that the, the word frequencies, there's so many words, they're normally distributed, so that's probably not a bad assumption. And what a z-score will tell you is if it is, quote, average, then it's going to fall between negative and positive 1. If it's outside of that kind of averageness window of the middle 67%, then it's going to be higher than one or less than negative one. So we're going to use this kind of, ah, that was very, very quick. Cool. And, and so now homicide is a little bit outside of average. Um, that's cool. That's cool. I like that. But, but look at uh, you know, gunshot, right? Gunshot, same thing. Kill. Interesting. Interesting. Um, and if we go back to the original table, we can see that kill appeared quite a number of times. Um, that's okay. That's that's kind of legit. And then on the spot, let's let's take a look at on the spot. How how did that appear? Oh, negative. It's it's a small number of times. Um, so it turns out that that maybe what I should have done instead of uh, straight up z-score is get the mean of that column and scale it differently because I've, I, I, I think that I've not, I've, I've, I've not um, grouped these well. I, I probably just want the mean of the column. Ah, uh, let's do a math formula. See, see, look, here's my problem. They go from zero to a zillion or whatever. We don't want them to go from zero. Um, we want them to, no, I'm not going to complicate this anymore. Um, let's just get a cutoff here. We don't want these guys. 
we're going to do it the Flintstone way to save some time. Austerity, all these words, all these words, look, Bormadag, that's, out of 62,000, that's just not good enough. Pseudonym specials, okay, okay, these are getting better. So we're going to use whatever, let's see what kind of words, these words, interesting, okay. We're going to use something around, I don't know, trademark 58, just because look at all the things that we're going to eliminate based on that. So although I use the normalizer because um, it gives you statistical frequencies, um, let me just look for trademark and go with what we've started. Trademark. There it is. Negative 0.007. Look at this. So why don't we just cut off at zero, right? Words that appeared more than average. I'm going to put in a row filter. And filter on the z-score. Column values. I know row IDs. And we're going to include zero standard deep feet. Zero Z score and up. Much better. A mere 3,000. Mere 3,000 words. Uh, so these occur in enough documents to where you could, you could kind of get decent frequencies here. Um, the other thing, though, is that, that there are certain words like first. Mm, I don't know that we want that. So let's go back and look at some look at our group table and figure out what constitutes too many words. Oh, look at these. Quote, after, marry, collection, ah, politician. We don't, we don't need all this. These are love, government. Look at how common these are. We didn't need the normalizer for this, actually. Um, but we could have just easily done it between 60 and and uh, whatever number we're about to come up with. But if our sample changed, then we wouldn't want, we wouldn't want cutoffs like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm going through here and I'm noticing that, okay, these are, these are still interesting. These are interesting words, consort, allegedly, we like these. But at some point, the words start to become, you know, brilliant, the words start to become a little bit more common, too common for us to care about anymore. And it looks like maybe, I don't know, around this time, culture. That's, I, you know, that's, now it's getting to be a bit much. Um, it's not as informative here. So let's go ahead and grandfather, right? Okay, so it's looking like 300. Let's go back and see the z-score for grandfather. Point six four six. Okay, so maybe one. One would be a good cutoff. It appears an average number of times, not a higher than average number of times, but it's not the low end of average either, is what we're essentially saying. How many voids? Okay, 2,400 words. Cool. So these are the words that we're actually going to do our tests on. And we have gotten them from here. And we're just going to pivot on these. Um, so we, we've we got these words from these articles, but it's a million. Man, we want to take out all those words that we're not testing on anymore. And so we use a reference column filter for that. So I'm going to go in here. Oh, sorry, a reference row filter. And it happens to be right there. And we use it before we pivot. So I'm going to put it right there. And we're going to use this list to determine which words we keep. The words are in the column values. And we're going to include the words from the reference table. And instead of a million rows, we now have 397,000. All right. You notice that, that we kept 
from this guy, homicide, kill, right? Homicide's no longer in there and kill is no longer in there. We're not going to test against homicide because apparently homicide didn't meet our, our, uh, our uh, Z-score test. Now you say, I'm actually interested in whether people with uh, stuff up there is, uh, are, are going to do homicide. And if you are, you would filter such that homicide makes it. I'm not going to do that, though, because you start making exceptions and you have whole lists that are statistically unruly. So we're going to go ahead and only pivot on this much reduced list. Man, it was a million and a half. We cut it down by maybe like a factor of four. Oh, this is so much faster than it was. Went from two minutes to basically 10 seconds. Okay, good. Now, instead of 25,000 columns, we've only got the 2,400 columns. So now, it's just a matter of saying, do the one and zero groups differ on these columns? First of all, let's replace our missings. And because, uh, you know, we, we don't want to give our nodes any kind of trouble. And if there's a number missing of any kind, we're going to fix the value and put a zero in there. And if there's a string missing, meaning the name or whatever, let's just take the row out. I don't, we don't want any missings in there at all. I mean, there's no need for us to put up with missings with a data set this big. Okay, so it's running. I always feel like the missing value filter is really slow. And, um, and, and maybe it's not slow, maybe it's just my mind. I'm thinking, all you're doing is putting zeros in the table. What is so hard about that? But, but maybe it's not, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's more to it than that. So let's see what we got here. All right, I don't think there are any missing values in here anymore. Next, we get to look at the t-test. We could take samples here, certainly. T-test. We could take samples here and uh, certainly maybe make it easier on ourselves. And we will in a second. But for right now, let's just do an independent groups t-test. Um, and the column is in section. And group one will be, yes, it's in the section. Group zero will be, no, it isn't. And we are not going to test on all these guys. That's going to take, although you could, you could. Um, but let's just test on abandon, abandon ability. I mean, what are the, what's the likelihood that that any of these will, will work? Remember, we've got 2,400 rows. And so it's running a different t-test for each one. And uh, wow, that's actually kind of quick. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with this. We may not even need to loop in here, which I thought we would need to. Okay. Yeah. So apparently those areas did not differ statistically. Oh, well, look at that. They didn't differ on those three. Not surprising. Duh, right? Is I just selected three random columns. So what you would say is that there's really no, there's no, uh, statistical difference between between people with their midheaven up there versus everybody else on average. Uh, and this is on the whole 42,000 here. Um, although this was closer, it's still 30% randomness or 41% randomness. Okay. Well, then shoot. That, that, that went so well, I think I'm just going to add them all. <laughs> right? um, I'm used to it not working because normally I'm not doing the t-test. I'm using other stuff. But we don't know how long this one's going to take, so I'm going to just kind of let it run. Now, it's going through all, or it's at least attempting to go through all 2,400 columns, and it's running a t-test on each one to see if in-section differs. And I'm hoping I didn't, okay, good, I excluded in-section itself. Um, well, see, executing, see that? It's actually running the different t-test on the different groups and different rows. It's running the Levines to, to kind of see, was it the more, the more, the more, the less? 
Yay, we got results. Nice. Let's see how these things fare. Look, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to look at this. Oh, wow. Look at this one. Yikes. Access. Now, this is equal variance is not assumed versus equal variance is assumed. I, I would love to get them both down. Some of these are, some of these are where equal variances are not assumed. Um, but, wow, oh, dang. You, you, you'd like to kind of get the ones where either way it works. Um, but, oh, so here's a, here's a decent one right here, accumulate. Okay, so, so do we have equal variances between those two groups? Probably. Probably. Let's just say that we are, because it's such a huge data set. Um, um, we are going to get rid of equal variances not assumed, and we're going to get rid of uh, anybody with a p-value greater than 0.05. I don't know, five. Although, Really, I would do it over like 0 0.01 or 0 0.001 just because of how these studies have gone. But, but the first thing that we'll do is a row filter. Wait a minute. We want to filter on two things. So we're not going to use a row filter. We're going to use a row filter labs. Row filter labs. Row filter labs lets you filter on multiple conditions at the same time. So, so we're going to add a condition. And condition one is where the variance assumption matches a pattern. And it includes the word, um, well, yeah, it, it excludes the word not, excludes the word not. So let's go ahead and check that one. The second condition is we want the p-value to be less than, for right now, 0.05. Let's just see, 0.05. And it's and, they both have to be true. And we're going to include this by query. So let's see if the query's remembered. Oh, it doesn't, man. Okay, well, fine. Let's do greater than. And then exclude them both. Okay. So if it has the word not assumed and it has um, a p-value, oh, it's not and, or it has a p-value greater than 0.05, then kick it out. So we want to change this assumption, or, there we go. Booyah. Ah, 108 statistically significant results. So. Apparently, people with, oh, this is so funny. Apparently, people with their midheaven in Sagittarius 9, that is 247.5 through 250, differ in these characteristics. This is so funny because, you know, I, I think about my own kind of traits and they're, well, this, this held for a long time, not so much now, but columnist commentary okay okay and uh some of these things are, are the stuff i actually do now you're not gonna you're not gonna have uh well not all of it <laughs> not all of it is stuff i actually do i'm looking at some of these words um yeah that's not legit but but anyway these are the kinds of these are the kinds of uh words that had st statistical uh statistically significant relationships now what were those relationships? Were they more than, less than? I, I don't know. So let's look at the results. Levine test. And uh, that's the test statistic on these guys, the p-value of, of your Levine. Uh -huh. Right. Let's see what the Levine test does, because it's a little down here. Right. Uh, 
So it's, it's funny. Look at the, your Levine test. What it says is it tests for equality of variances. So I assumed that uh, that the variances were uh, pretty much the same. But on a couple of these, maybe they weren't, uh, like accumulate or something like that. And so this would have controlled my filter. Uh, but for the most part, you're seeing that, I don't know, they're, well, they, they vary. Eh, mm, yeah, I forgot that I needed to do this instead of just making the base assumption. So we're going to, normally what you would do is say, if this is statistically significant, then it would control whether or not your, uh, it, it would control whether or not you filtered out assumed versus not assumed. That matters. Um, so... I'm gonna. Uh, hmm. I don't know that I want to go through all that trouble for this particular recording. We're we're not going to. But but normally what you would say is if it's greater than uh, your your p value for the Levine test, then keep one of them. If it's less than, then keep the other one in this column. Let's let's just let's just skip that for now because. Um, you know, when you're doing like your, your your dissertation or something like that, sometimes you're asked to calculate the the additional tests, like for homo homoscedasticity, heteroscedasticity, um, skew, uh, to see if your data is messed up beforehand. But you can you can get all I, I hate to say in the weeds because it's not quite in the weeds, but you can certainly go down different kinds of rabbit hole, um, trying to make sure that your assumptions about your statistical distribution are are met beforehand. So I'm going to do it the way, unfortunately, many of us who who, who uh, have to do this kind of stuff do it. And that's just going to, you know, we're going to assume, <laughs> unfortunately, we're just going to assume that it's, it's the correct distribution of uh, variances. So anyway, we're here. And let's see one other thing that comes out. Descriptive statistics. Now take a look at this, right? This is really what we're, we're looking for. You see how Abandon group one had had this mean, group zero had this mean. Ability, group one had this mean, and group zero had this mean. It would be really nice to attach this stuff to the column we just got, right? Uh, because that way we could say, oh, this was the list of statistically significant differences. I'd like to know. And it tells me what the mean difference is. Okay, it, it kind of tells me, right? I didn't think that that was a, oh no, this is standard error difference. This is the mean difference right here. Okay, so accumulate. Let's look at accumulate. 0 0.006. We go here. And here's accumulate. Ah, you see that? Group one was higher by 0 0.06. Okay, well then shoot then. We can get that data from, from this table right here. So apparently these were all more by group one. I don't see any of them that were less. Sort descending tells you the strongest differences. Episode, okay, so apparently Sagittarius 9 is more likely to have these kinds of traits um, strongly different from everybody else. Okay, so that's one kind of test that we can do. Which words were different? Okay, let's do a different kind of test. I kind of want to know, uh, starting here, what combinations of words in here are going to more likely put you as part of in section? Now, this is kind of built into pieces. It, it builds in pieces of the t-test. But we're going to do a, a, really, I would want to do a logistic regression because this is for a yes-no group. You could also do it on a linear regression, but to be honest, a linear regression is like, okay, add a little bit of abandon, subtract a little bit of a bend, and uh, maybe we don't want to do that. So, so let's, let's do a logistic regression, and it's going to assign groups 
logistic regression learner on oh row IDs nah we don't want we don't want that so we're gonna change our number to a string because we need to make our our stuff categorical and in section is something that we want to make categorical okay so it's, it's turning the in section variable into a string instead of a number see now it's an s up there it is qualified to be put through the logistic regression learner now Let's double click that there we go oh no we don't want that take that out okay we don't want this either so and again our words might change we just want to exclude the names uh, this thing is probably not going to work there are way 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 too many um, words in here but let's put a zero in there as the reference category that way if you need more abandon in order to put you in section then it's going to add all right I think this thing is going to like not like this or take forever. It often fails because of Java heap space because I'm doing too much. And, and if it does fail, then the way you would work with it is to do uh, a column list loop. But I'm going to go ahead and pause this and wait for this thing to do what it's doing. Amazingly, about a minute and a half later, it didn't fail. And it says the algorithm did not converge. And that's not that's not surprising. Let's look at the coefficients and the set. So if you do this, you're going to get something to plug in elsewhere. It's because it spits out the model first. Let's look at this coefficients and statistics. Okay, so here, here's the logistic regression. This is very cool because normally it doesn't doesn't fin doesn't finish. Um, first of all, let's see if we had anything that. Oh, okay, we have some some. Well, the constant nobody cares, but okay, we have some. Uh, P less than 0.01. We got a little bit of a little bit of something in there. Uh, okay, okay, I, I like this, right? And as far as P.05, I mean, you can you can see that there's some some things in there. Um, the coefficients, most of these coefficients are are positive. So, you know, it's interesting if you look at the constant on this. Um, So, so, first of all, I, I got to clean this up. Let, let me take the row filter, um, row filter here, and I uh, we're gonna take the p value where the lower, the upper bound is 0 0.05, 0 0.05. Okay. Okay, this is better. This table of 46 words, these are the only ones that are worth caring about. They're less likely to be random. So including the constant. Now, if you look at this constant, it's a negative five, it's a negative six, basically. And basically, if you include in, is, is, look at these coefficients. Most of them are like two and three or something like that. For the most part, what that suggests to me, at least, is that if you had any two of these words, you're more likely to start offsetting the constant. Um, and any three of these words can get you closer to a one in terms of you know, being part of that other group. And, and so essentially, because the constant is is on that scale compared to all these words. Now, this is just what it suggests to me, just it's kind of a layman's interpretation of a logistic regression. Um, it's not that if you're a vice president, you're more likely to have your, your asteroid in that section. It's that if you had any three of these words, more or less, the chances of you being part of that particular section um, with 
you know, in this case, the midheaven in Sagittarius 9 are higher. Okay, so that's that's kind of what this suggests to me. It is interesting though that these are these are the words that come out. Now, to to help myself kind of believe this, remember we had words that that had statistical significant statistically significant differences in the t test, and so I'm just going to use a joiner to kind of compound what we've done. I'm going to take a left outer join because I want the constant of the logistic regression with the columns of the t-test, right? I don't, I don't necessarily want every result. I like the p-value for the two-tailed t-test, and I like the mean difference. Um, you can look at other things, but, but, but there's that. And then over here, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of like the p-value and the coefficient for this one. Logit variable coefficient and p-value. So we are going, oh, sorry, I need to get what the thing was. Variable. And here, test column. So that's what we're going to join on. Variable and test column. It is a left outer join because we want the constant. We want the logit, the variable, the coefficient, and the p-value. I'm going to get rid of these other guys. And I'll take variance assumption, the uh, two-tailed, and the mean difference. That, this is just kind of what I'm interested in for the moment. Booyah, we run it, join result. Okay, look. So 46 words. These were not only featured in the logistic regression, but they were featured in the t-test differences as well. So if you wanted to know what that particular section of uh, Sagittarius was about, th these guys here would be really good kind of indicators. Any, remember, any, any two or three of these guys um, are kind of the association with a midheaven in Sagittarius 9. Um, if we had to interpret this, by the way, and you just had to say, I want to make a statement about a midheaven in Sagittarius 9, what would I do? Um, well, I, I think I should have had the percent difference, not just the mean difference, because that stuff scales. Let me let me go in here and see if there's a percent difference. Uh, mean difference, you know, is standard error of the difference. Um, I guess standard error is really what we would want. Let me, let me put standard error in there. Okay. Oh, run it. All right. I'm going to sort descending by this. Oh, okay. Drawing the animal. <laughs> that's that's kind of cool, right? Kind of cool. Drawing the animal. Picking water usually to nominate property legs. You know, I don't know. That's that's a robot might put a sentence together that read in this way or something like that in order to to kind of interpret what a midheaven in Sagittarius 9 does. So there you have it. We've uh what, what did this what did this do? Well, what it said was that a particular section of the astro wheel, when you have a body in there. Uh, is statistically different from the average other from from being located in the average other section. If we had tested the sun, then we could test basic sun signs in this way. What I did is I tested midheaven between twenty seven between two forty seven point five and two hundred fifty Sagittarius. But if you wanted to statistically test what the sun sign for Sagittarius as a whole would do, it's instead of testing midheaven, you test sun. And instead of testing 247.5 through 250, you would test 240 degrees through 270 degrees, and you would run exactly the same test. Um, and 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 then at that point, you're like, oh, okay, well, this, you know, the hocus pocus of it is gone. Um, I I now see what Sagittarius is more likely to be about. I'm going to pause this recording because it it will pain me 
to run my R snippet for as long as one must run it in order to spit out the sun results. And the reason I didn't do sun in this video is because I'm recording this video on the fly and I wasn't really interested in sun signs, as I said before, but you could get a sun column in here and get that analysis going. And frankly, that stuff is so kind of thorough though, uh, just in terms of heuristics, like I said, it's not, it's not as informative in, in terms of research. But one thing that I might do is look up an ANOVA to see whether people have their a general difference in uh, their uh, let's let's do let's do moon signs uh, instead of the head. Um, do people with uh, their moon in different entire signs differ from each other? Now, some you know the ANOVA node is 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 much like the logistic regression learner can be hit and miss depending on how things are divided. But here, let's let's take the moon. We're we're gonna add an ANOVA because I said that I would. Um, first of all, we have our row ID, and uh, things come from there. Looks like we're gonna have to do a rule engine as well. Um, I, I can still work with the in section column made because I don't I don't really want to do that again, and so. It, it's not going to harm anybody to have that extra column there. I'm going to take them all out anyway. Um, off of this data table, let's use something called a binner. An auto binner. And that auto binner will... Hey, where's my... Uh, where's my... Uh, Oh, that's that's well that that kind of makes me sad because because I'm looking for oh it's a string ah because it came from the dang uh, what's his what's his face it, it it came from the R output all right no wonder it wasn't available let's do string to number string to number right here. We're going to do string to number on just the moon because the moon is the only one that I care about here. Uh, let's use it as a double. Of course, nah, let's, let's just do it right here. And then we're going to auto bend the moon. This is just a fun, kind of a funsies thing. We don't want in section. And how many bends? 12. Oh, we can have equal width, right? We can have a uh, there you go. Booyah. See what we got with this auto binner. We have our moon. Bin 1. Bin 11. Look at this. Bin 2. Uh, Taurus, right? Bin 1, right? Let me smooth this over. I'm not going to sort these. Yet cause, but, but look, bin 2 is basically Taurus. Bin 4 is basically Cancer. I mean, we knew that it's equal width and it's from zero to 360. So the binner was was very friendly. You can replace these with uh, you can and you should re replace these with uh, basically a lookup table. Um, it's a bit of a pain to to do that. So what I'm going to do instead of a lookup table is just use a joiner. Um, because I, 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 I don't, sorry, in, instead of a, a rule engine replacer. Um, oh, yeah, you know what? Maybe I should use the, the, the rule engine. That's so, ugh, you know, that, that the rule engine dictionary, I don't, I don't really, not dictionary. Um, there's, there's a rule engine. Um, oh, it's a rule set. It's called a rule set. I, I, I don't remember it, but it's, 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 it's a real, I don't know. It's, it's weird to work with. So we're going to do it. We're going to do it this way instead. I'm going to make a table that has the signs and, um, here, let's do this the quick way. 
I'm going to go to Excel and go into my uh, asteroid aggregation. And I'm just going to make a new Excel workbook. Bin one. And then do that. And then let's go to my asteroid file. And uh, there's a lookup table somewhere in here. Asteroids. Nah, I don't want to. Just... Looking around. Let's just type them out. Okay, they're typed. Nimes table creator is, you know, moving around. It's a little bit funny. So, okay, there we go. Let's double click on this. It pops up this window. And we'll just call that bin. And double click on this. Pops up this window. We'll call it sign. There. Okay, we made that table. I'm not going to mess with that. And then uh, let's do a joiner. Join. And we're going to join on the bin and the moon bin. And I don't want this. Just a sign. And also, while we're here, I actually don't want any of these. So we don't want any of these extras. Let's take them out. We don't even really need the bins. Um, let's there. Cool. Okay, so this is where our uh, moon sign is what that should have been. Okay. Boom. Here. Join result. Gotcha. Now that's going to be joined to basically the same business that we did before. Control C, Control V, and this guy goes down here. This guy goes up there, goes, goes up there. Run it. Because we're joining on the same, same stuff, right? Join result. Oh, split values. Maybe I have, I have flubbed this. Um, uh, I think I have. Probably because I didn't set anything up. Let me let me look. Row ID name. I mean, I I don't. It, it seemed like it was trying, but I I think at this point I'm just being lazy. That's probably what happened. I I I have a result. You see, it's got row ID. Oh, it attached the row ID. Oh, look at what happened. It's got rows. Oh, we don't want rows on these names, man. Uh, it's because I joined it already. Oh, yikes. Mm, okay. We have to take the row ID off of the... See this? It put row underscore row on there, and that's just how the joiner works. We need that off of there. So... Mm, this is a this is an extra step, which is inconvenient. But first, let's get the row ID, and we're not going to replace it. We're just going to obtain it. Create a new column with the row ID values. New column name row. There. Here. Process data. Okay. See now we've got it as a string. Now let's go to a string replacer. Here, boom, row, and we've got some stuff, dot plus, that's a group, and then we've got some other stuff, starting with an underscore, dot plus, uh, maybe it's not even dot plus, let's say it's dot star, it's just anything, 
and we're going to replace it only with the results of the first group. This is a regular expression over the whole occurrence, and let's see what we got here. Just taking these underscores out, taking them out. They're gone. Underscores are gone. Next, another row ID. And we're going to have that be the new thing, remove that column, boom. All right, okay. No more of those random underscores, they're gone. We're gonna join this, run it. There it goes. See what we got. Results, okay, so we have results. It's gonna be same story as it was last time. All these guys right here, all the things that we did, same stuff. So I'm just going to copy that. Now, in section is no longer a thing. So in section comes out and is replaced with moon sign. This comes out. I'm double clicking. There you go. Unpivot. Boom. That's going to take a while. Oh, no, it isn't. Okay, uh, group by, this looks pretty clean. Uh, we didn't really need the normalizer, but okay, let's, let's just run this and see what happens. This reference role filter, okay. Look, it's set up nicely. Ah, speed, the speed. Hey, look, we have moon signs and we've got words. We've got, got some stuff in here. Let's do some pivoting. Rows, and this time, in section comes out, moon sign comes in, pivots are preserved, boom. Wait a minute, what did I do? In section comes out, moon sign comes in. Don't cancel it. Run it. You can see how these workflows get kind of nasty. They get huge while you're, you're, you're doing your thing. This pivot took a while the first time, if you recall. Oh, but then I filtered it. Nice. Pivot table. What do we have? Nice. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Then there was a missing value filter. Here, here, same deal as before. And with that, with the results at least of this pivot table, we're ready to do an ANOVA. The ANOVA is going to see whether there are differences in these, these groups. Now, I've, I expect the ANOVA to break because there's just a lot of data in here. And breaking is, is, is kind of how that works. But, but we'll see if we can get it. One way ANOVA. The group will be the moon sign. And I'm going to go for broke and see if I can just do it on all 2400. I probably can. And so I'm expecting it to fail pretty quickly. Um, Java heap space or whatever. But because these are ones and zeros, you never know. Now, really, this is kind of the wrong test because we only have ones and zeros. And, and truly, you would, uh, this is subject to a non-parametric test. And so what I should have done was, was basically done a group by and checked the means of the appearances or something, the means or the sums or something. Because right now I'm doing an ANOVA on basically ones and zeros. And so this is, this is kind of not a legit test, what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm rushing through this. But, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the test will cover what it needs to. Okay, it's done. That took about a minute and a half. So, so there are a lot of assumptions that I've kind of skipped, but let's see what happened. Do these guys differ on anything, really? Now, uh, here's some p-values between groups, within groups, all kinds of stuff. Some of them are, are, are getting near the... Uh, 
0.05 type level, just eyeballing. That was a 0.01 adapt, right? Uh, apparently, there's some some differences in it. Ah, look at this one. Address. I don't know what that is about. Anyway, admire. Oh, nice. Okay. So, admire, for example, look at this. This is statistically significant. One of those groups was was differing on the word admire. Okay, we need to help ourselves out here and only keep p-values. Um, here, let me see. We're gonna we're gonna only. Oh, I don't want to do that. Let's. I'm just gonna copy my row filter. We only want p-values up to 0 0.05. Same as same as before. Okay, these were the words. These are the words that kind of differentiated these guys. Now you want to know how they were different because this is an ANOVA. Let's look at the Levine test. Here's where the Levine. No, that's not that. That's that's variances, equality of variances. And again, more assumption. It's the descriptives. Look at this. This is where everybody fell on the word abandon. Ah, it's more or less the same, right? But if we can join this to our other table, we can hook on the p-values for whoever we kept. And that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to take another joiner and I'm going to say on these words, remember that so on these words with these groups, look at that. This is a nice, nice sample here of things. Uh, and it's got totals, but uh, I, we don't want totals. But on these words with these groups, join whoever we kept, which would be these guys. So the test column, the test column. It's an inner join. Um, we don't we don't need all these columns. I uh, the group yes. Um, let's do the. I'm gonna I'm gonna just join them all because I don't I don't remember what happened here. Source p value. That's what we oh and also the f maybe. Source p value f and then for this one. We want test group in, and let's just say the uh, mean and the standard deviation. Okay, I'll keep standard error as well. Here, here. We don't need the test column a second time. All right. Boom. Join result. Okay, so so now if you look at this, you have that these guys were all significant, and I'm gonna sort ascending. Oh, they differed quite a bit on passport. <laughs> so so there's some stuff associated with travel, some some folklore, right? I I, I don't want these total columns. They're, 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 they're getting on my nerves. Let me take them out. Wait a minute. Um, row filter. Row filter. Okay, so uh, we are getting rid of a test column with the word total in it. Exclude that. All right, they're gone. Well, no, no, they're not gone. It's the group. Getting rid of a group. Okay, that's better. They're gone. Now, you know your astrological folklore, then uh, you know that, that certain things are associated with, with uh, like you know, travel and stuff. So I'm sort of ascending passport, right? Look at this. This is kind of interesting. Um, you got different results. 
but Aries 0.04. So this is a moon sign in Aries. And this one here is a moon sign in Libra. Passport. Um, uh, who knows? Who knows what that means? Well, Sagittarius, right? These are on the upper end of uh, those groups. There's a way to, to, to kind of filter this stuff. But, but basically, if you have your moon in these particular areas, then these are are uh these are i don't say the the well they're just the means let's not let's not elaborate on that um so if your moon is in aries then uh you had a higher mean for the occurrence of the word passport um does that tell you anything well it can if you're able to basically organize this data in a way that makes sense you know, so ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at what makes sense in terms of interpretability. This isn't terribly interpretable. And uh, so we, we have to think about our question. What was our original question? It was, what do moon signs do? And um, so, so I would like to know if having both Aries and something like a higher mean than everybody else or a lower mean, than everybody else um, is 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 what comes with and and that's for the word passport. Well, is 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 what comes with the word passport. So how are we going to do this? Let's finish up this recording by making this a little bit more interpretable. I'm only going to look at the word passport, and um, I'm going to try to find not so much who the maximum was, but who's abnormal. Um, so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do this by groups. I'm gonna do a group loop on the test column so that I can I can attach z scores within groups. So let's first of all take a take a look at the uh, normalizer again. What the normalizer does is allows you to just kind of assign your uh, Let's look at means, right? And we'll do z-score normalization right here. Okay, so now what has happened is that it's put this in terms of higher or lower. So here, if I go back to ascending, here's passport again. Remember we had those initial values? You can see the Taurus is lower uh, in terms of z-scores, lower than expected. But... Um, that Aries looks like it's pretty average. Gemini is lower in terms of this this stuff. Uh, Pisces higher. Now, here's the problem. The problem is that I did this across the whole table. I don't want to do it across the whole table. I want to do it within Passport. Uh, so that normalizer has to be applied in a group. So let's do a group loop. Group loop start. And we're going to group by the word, the test column. When I execute, see now it only looks at above, and then it can assign a normalizer to that. Okay, so here for the word above, Virgo was very low, right? And Aries is very high. So the word above is more likely to, to occur here. What we would like to do is say, if you're higher than one standard deviation for this particular group of 12, keep you as higher. If you're lower than one standard deviation, the negative one, keep you as lower. So we're going to do a row splitter and say, if the mean is uh, between negative 1 and positive 1, take it out. We're only keeping extremes here. 
So that's this is so we know statistical statistically significant differences. And so now you see that with this with the negatives we can say lower than average, and with the positives we can say higher than average. Um, oh, and this is what's filtered out. Interesting. Um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to use a real filter here. Insert it. I'm going to use the same rules. The mean, range checking, negative 1 to positive 1, take them out, and I'm going to, same results, right? But I'm going to repurpose the second thing to say if the mean is has an upper bound of negative 1, then keep it, otherwise take it out. And what that does is put the low guys on the top and put the high guys on the bottom. Next. Um, and we could have we could have actually done a rule engine on this and just just because I'm about to add a constant value column. Sorry, I keep doing this, but there's so many ways to, 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 to address something in nine, but the quickest way is probably a rule engine. So let me get rid of this guy. I don't need to, I don't need to do that. Rule engine. And with your rule engine, we can say that if the mean is less than or equal to zero, then output uh, lower than average. Otherwise, by default, output higher than average. This is within the group. And this is kind of like the word frequency. Okay. Lower than average, higher than average. Virgo above. All right. We're almost done. Loop end. We are not going, we're going to leave the rows unmodified. We're not going to add iteration column. We're not going to ignore this. We want this stuff to make sense. Run it. Oh, it's over. Great. Aha. So now we have these groups. Okay, Aquarius, higher than average, lower than average. Um, these are all those traits that are higher for Aquarius moon signs. Remember, we're doing moon signs. You could easily do this with sun signs, but, you know, whatever. Um, whether they're higher or lower than average, uh, now we, we, we almost don't need all the p-values and stuff because that's what we use to determine whether these were even legit. They're all p, less than 0.05, so this is uninformative to us. Um, the means, again, same thing. We, we, we z-scored them now, and they're, they're, they're pretty much meaningless. So the only columns that we're concerned with in terms of moon signs are these first three. Uh, can we get this in a more kind of visual uh, representation? We could, but, uh, you know, frankly, let, for right now, I'm just going to not look at the lower than averages one. So we'll do one more row filter on here and take out lower. This, if, it, if it includes this, contains wild cards, just remove it. We're just going to get a basic look at moon signs, what they're higher than average in. Sort by ascending by here. Aquarius is higher than average in these words. Ambassador and the moon signs, right? Ambassador, benefit, dance, genius, uh, respectively, universal, zoologist, gift, whatever. How about Aries? Aries was higher than average in apparently a whole bunch of stuff. Moon and Aries. 
I don't know. Maybe maybe Aries just wants to do whatever it wants to do. Uh, Capricorn, this is funny. Bus conclusion convict, right? Moon in, in Capricorn psychology, psychiatry. Some of these don't have to do with people. Gemini, right? These are things that moons in Gemini are higher in. Leo. Things that moons in Leo are higher than. Look at this. Isn't this, isn't this like stereotypical astrology, right? Celebrate, co-star, hair, maybe. Um, notable. This is very, this is very like stuff you, you, you kind of know about Leo uh, from astrology. If, if we get down to Scorpio and it starts talking about, you know, power and stuff like that, then we know that we're really looking at some, 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 some stuff here. Libra, nice. Aristocrat. I mean, you, you like when your biases are confirmed. <laughs> That's, I mean, they're called hypotheses, I guess. I air quote that, um, you know. But, I mean, it's not all of them, but but still, it's a uh, sculpture. You know, gift is, is shown up quite a bit. But Sagittarius, dress, assault, mm, passport, right? Higher there. Scorpio, right? Anatomy, condemn, convict, governor. Yeah, these are Scorpio type things. Uh, Taurus, above, admire greatly, possessions, right? And uh, so on and so forth. And here's Virgo. Okay, so this is it. These are, this is astro folklore for moon signs. Um, does this, does this, quote, prove astrology? Well, I mean, it doesn't prove anything in the sense that uh, scientific publication, um, those things, when their p-values are, are aired and their statistical tests are run, r-squareds and all that, those, quote, prove things. It's, it's, but it's the same standard of analysis, right? So here we went through and we found these words in people's articles and we found that the moons were sitting in these degrees here. And uh, we looked at the frequencies of these guys' appearances. And we looked at the, the degrees of the moon in there. And certainly we had more than our fair share of, of, of p-values. Um, you know, we, for, for the ANOVAs and the, the, the grouping and stuff, some of these p-values are actually kind of dramatic, right? That's uh, 0.01. They're, they're, they're definitely less than point. 0.01 even, you know, standard Aquarius genius, right? Stuff like that. And Sagittarius, and they have this as well. Okay, so that's nine. And that's how you use an ANOVA, a logistic regression, and a t-test to, to test some stuff, even stuff which is, you know, um, notoriously fuzzy in its nature.